All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, this is Tom Dros, the co-founder of Estimate Rocket. At Estimate Rocket, we're completely committed to providing powerful, easy-to-use technology that empowers service contractors to thrive both professionally and personally. We're here today for another success webinar, and uh, we're going to talk about staying in touch with your customers through the process, how and why. Uh, it's been, it's, uh, I'm usually involved a lot in the how parts of things, so it was kind of fun uh, doing some preparation for this presentation. Uh, and uh, I learned a few interesting things along the way myself, so I'm uh, looking forward to sharing those with you. Uh, I think I'm sharing my screen, and I am. Okay. Uh, so, again, uh, how and why of staying in touch with your customers throughout the process. Uh, so, you know, there's, a, there's a, some simple answers and there's some deeper answers uh, to that question. The bottom line is we invest a lot of time in every prospect and every customer, both, uh, you know, time-wise, and we also invest a lot of emotional capital. We care about our customers. We want to succeed. We want to grow. Uh, we want to make sure that we maximize that effort by following up. Got some fun facts to share in a couple minutes about that. So we're going to talk a little bit about the, the whys, uh, and then we're going to go through some of the ways to do that within Estimate Rocket uh, that you may or may not be using, or you may not be using to their fullest extent. So I think we're going to have some, some fun with that. Uh, and at the end, I'll share a few resources that you can use to find out more information. Of course, you can always use the chat uh, in the app and uh, ask questions of our great support team, and, um, and, and hopefully we'll get you answers to those. So why? That's the first question. You know, why do we want to follow up? I think in our hearts, we all know, because if we don't follow up, we're probably not going to get the jobs. So obviously, that's a big part of, of what we do. And, and again, we put a lot of effort and time into it. We want to make sure we maximize the success of those efforts. Uh, otherwise, we're just, we're just wasting time. So uh, I have a few confessions to make. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I've been on the how side of things, the technical side of things for a long, long time. Uh, and still am, but uh, also have learned that the importance of marketing and sales. So I feel your pain when it comes to not following up with customers. It's hard sometimes. It takes extra time. We don't always have the right answers. We, they may have already said no or not until next year or given us a variety of different reasons. But, you know, we, we so I, I share that pain. I understand it. However, uh, you know, it's really important for a long time, you know, I rarely followed up more than once, and as you'll see, that's uh, that's a no-no, as you guys probably mostly know. Uh, it is time-consuming, demoralizing, never seems to work. Well, sometimes it does. So my spoiler alert for today is following up works. It really does. Um, some of my favorite stories uh, from Estimate Rocket users, actually, are ones that started using the automated follow-up campaigns, uh, almost anecdotally, and uh, were telling me stories of, jobs they got that they forgot they even had out there. But, but, but because they initiated an automated follow-up or a follow-up sequence, they actually closed deals that they thought were long gone. So following up doesn't necessarily mean that every single step of the way has to be you doing it. You just need to get a system in place that'll help you do those follow-ups for you. Uh, as we go along, by the way, if you do have questions, there's a little question box in your control panel. Please feel free to pop them in over there. Uh, I'll probably get to them at the end of the of the presentation, uh, unless it's uh, something that I can handle quick while we're and that's uh, relative to what we're actually talking about. So uh, feel free to ask your questions, and we'll get back to you later on those. Uh, so this is an important question: Are you in the right place today? Uh, and and there's three three questions. Uh, do you want to grow your business? Do you want to have happy, even raving fan customers? And do you have limited time? So those are the three reasons. You know, if you answer yes to all those questions, you are absolutely in the right place. And I don't think you'll you'll be wasting the next uh, half hour, 45 minutes uh, worth of time. So, but it's an important question to ask. And and there are people who who don't, and that you know they're very happy with where they are, or or one or two jobs at a time, or, and aren't looking for that next job. Um, to that, I will say, even if you don't have massive growth aspirations, um, being able to plan your life out more than a month at a time is really empowering. So uh, going after business doesn't mean it all has to happen today, even though your customers may want it. Going after that business 
can be plant for planning in the future. Yep, a month out, two months out. And, and what that empowers, by the way, is as you get booked farther and farther out, and a lot of you I know already, already are familiar with the concept, as you get booked farther and farther out in, into the future, that gives you the ability to, to go and hire more resources and find more help and be confident that you're not gonna be struggling to keep that help busy. Because if you do add help, then some of those jobs that you scheduled way out, you can probably reschedule for sooner. So it really gives you, by, by being able to plan farther out into the future, it empowers you to, to it enables you to grow at a better pace and at a measured pace. So it, even if you're not a massively growth aspired, uh, it's still important to do. And, and if you do wanna grow and you're not following up, well, as you'll see again, there's, that's gonna be a limiter to, to where you're gonna go. So this was kind of my uh, most fun part of the exercise was I found a few very interesting fun facts. I'm gonna kind of read through these, but I strongly recommend some of the numbers are a little tricky uh, that you might want to reread them later. The presentation will be available and there'll be a recording of this webinar so you can you can view it later. But uh, this is the main one, the first one here. And this is this is sort of the tenant of all sales. I mean, I you can I went doing some searching and and there is no lack of sources that confirm that five follow-ups is very typical for a typical sale. Now, that doesn't mean you don't close them in on the, you know, on the on the first appointment or the second appointment or the second call, but on average, it takes five follow-ups. Now, the other interesting part of that and more powerful part of that is 44% of sales reps give up after the first try. Crazy. You've made the effort, you've you've you know made some contact to that that prospect. Heaven forbid you've actually sent them an estimate and aren't following up, but you know, you've made that initial contact. You know, why if you don't follow up, that's crazy. The second piece is um, there are only so that that leaves about eight percent of salespeople that follow what's called the no, the five no no's rule. It's hard to say. Uh, the five no's rule simply says you got to be told no five times before you can be have any level of content, confidence that that customer really means no. Uh, and I'm not advocating being irritating to the customers. There are lots of ways to follow up with people that are not irritating, but you got to follow up. You got to follow up. Uh, and, and so what happens is the ones that don't, they give up after one try or two tries or three tries. That the the eight percent that do go to all five no's are getting eighty percent of the sales. Think about that for a minute. Just because you're not calling them back or sending them an email or doing any kind of a follow up, that's really silly. Why why hurt your odds that way? There's some things in here as you read them, as you read through them, you go, geez, that's like that's silly. Why wouldn't we do that? Um, uh, how many sales go to the first to follow up? 30 to 50 percent. So it is important to follow up quickly. Um, there's no there's no substitute for getting that initial follow up out, especially if people have asked for estimates and you want to get their estimates or their proposals out quickly so that they can have a chance before the, someone else closes them. Um, salespeople that actively seek out referrals make four to five times more than those that don't. Another, this is another, wow, think about that for a minute. Uh, and 91% of customers say they'll give a referral and only 11% of salespeople actually ask for referrals. So there's a good question and this is a great use for follow-up is to ask for referrals. Um, and I see a lot of that. I will say I have a lot of um, great Estimate Rocket customers that are that are really adhering to this concept and I do see uh, I do see those follow-up emails and I see the referral emails. A lot of them have introduced newsletters, which is a great concept. Um, and, it, and it does work. It keeps you in the person's eye. And most of your customers uh, are, are, repeat, are really potential repeat customers and, and everybody is a potential referral, you know, referral customer. Uh, lastly, retaining current customers is six to seven times less costly than acquiring new ones. So, Again, talking to your old customers, your former customers, is usually much more effective and much less costly for you 
than going out and finding a new cold lead that doesn't know anything about you. So, uh, you know, paying attention to and staying in touch with those customers uh, are really, is really critical. Uh, there's a question about how many follow-ups uh, and what the time frame should be for that. I'm gonna talk about that in a little bit. Uh, so so uh, for moving on from fun facts. Uh, so here's another piece of information that I think is really important. I think sometimes we we don't think enough about the fact that there are many different things that cause people not to proceed with a sale. A lot of different things. Right now, everybody's life is in topsy turvy with the uh, with the current uh, COVID-19 uh, issue. It's a big deal, obviously, and people are making decisions in very different ways. Now, the good news is, I think, in general, for service contractors, it's been good because people are staying home. People are thinking, well, I'm not doing anything else, so let's let's fix up the house or let's do something new to the house. So that that's a good thing. But there are a lot of reasons that customers don't buy. So inertia is a great great one. Um, you know, you get in that mode where yeah, you've gotten a couple quotes and you're just not ready to move. Those people want to do something, but but the and the person who stays in touch with them again, not to irritate them, but to you know keep in contact, are likely to get the deal when that person's you know ends their inertia and is ready to go and, and jump. So uh, you know, key, real key, lack of time. That's another one. Uh, that's why how long you continue to follow up people can with people can be very important because sometimes. Their time frame, you know, you think that their time frame is a week or two weeks, and a lot of the time their time frame is really three or four months. They're not, they're just, you know, they're just planning this out now. They have no idea what, you know, what they want to do or exactly how they want to do it. So they're kind of in that planning phase. They may not have time to actually get this done now. They just want to get some information and figure out what's going on. But when you when you know that, when you know that they're not ready to do it because they don't have any time to do it right now, then you can ask the question, hey, you know, let me know when I should follow up with you. Can I follow or can I be a little more proactive? Uh, maybe when when can I follow up with you again or can I follow up with you again in a month and, and see what they say? Because that way you're at least staying, you're showing that you care, you heard what they said, but you still are interested in having their business. So, you know, help me, let me know when I can follow up with you. Uh, a lot of these other, you know, these others we've, you've, uh, we've all heard, you know, too many things in their mind, uh, cost, cash flow, and there's lots of things we can do about that in terms of using credit cards uh, when possible and sometimes potential for financing. Um, more pressing matters, uh, you know, I think the last one is interesting, uh, your failure to do enough marketing to establish your name. So that's a biggie. Um, you have to have a reputation in in the uh, in, in your community, in your uh, trade area. And uh, a great way to establish that reputation, in addition to your website and your marketing, is referrals. You know your your past customers, in addition to being future customers, they are also typically your greatest, greatest source for referral work. because when they say something good about you, Everybody's apprehensive about hiring a contractor. And when their neighbor says, man, I had my painting done or I had my concrete lifting done or I had my uh, wallboard done by or I had my kitchen remodeled by, that's it. You know, that that is the ultimate invalidation of that person. And yeah, that doesn't mean they're not going to check out anyone else, but it means that all of a sudden you have your love, the level of trust in your organization has just gone up based on their respect for that neighbor or that source of the referral. So um, it's very important. It's very important to let customers know that you want referrals. And again, not everybody does, not everybody thinks to do that. And sometimes they may perceive that you're so busy you don't need any referrals. That's a real thing. So we want to be careful as we're talking with our customers not to, um, to make sure that we don't put out that impression that we just don't have enough time to do any work. Yeah, we may have to schedule things out a little bit in the future, but we're always looking for, for new jobs and, and you know, good, good jobs to do for people. And, and I will admit, I'm not, uh, I am not a marketing expert, so, uh, but I have learned a lot about marketing in the last couple of years. Uh, and I've also, like many other people, had experiences with service, personal experiences with service contractors. And it's really true that the service contractor who follows up any contractor that you're dealing with or any product that you're buying, 
that follows up in an appropriate way, they that you know puts them way out in the lead over the person who doesn't follow up. It, it, it yeah. How can you how can you ignore the the positive attention? You can't. So, next thing we want to talk a little bit about is how we're going to do that. So, what are our what are our ways to do that? Uh, and and we're going to talk specifically about some things that you can do within the context of Estimate Rocket in order to make that follow up uh, the whole follow up game a lot easier. So, uh, first of all, ways to follow up. I mean, some of you, I'm sure, have, have used some or all of these. Um, you know, you can certainly send an email manually anytime from a project. Um, that's one key way to do it. And we're going to get into some details in a second. Uh, there are follow-up campaigns, and you can set them to be manual or automatic. Again, hopefully, most of you are using at least one or more of those. But if you're not, you really need to take some time to explore them. Uh, they are just huge, nothing else, they're huge time savers, but really importantly, they can help you uh, solve the five no's problem really, really hassle-free. So it, it, it just, if you're not using the follow-up campaigns or some, I'll show you some other alternatives to follow-up campaigns, uh, you're, just, you're just making more work for yourself and you're reducing your chances of getting the job. Um, this next one is really uh, close to close to my heart, I think. Um, the email, the things in your campaign don't all need to go to the customer. It's very important, especially in the sales follow-up campaign. I like to see people emailing themselves a note, a note with the customer's e uh, phone number in it to call the customer after so many days. So you send out a proposal, you send out an email follow-up, Maybe you send another email follow-up, or maybe you call as the third follow-up. That, that is just so powerful. Most business ends up being closed over the phone, not via email. Email may, will hopefully inspire a call, but generally speaking, when people accept things, there's a phone call involved at some point there. So I like to see people using one of their campaign steps or more of their campaign steps as simply a reminder to them to pick up the phone and call the customer. Very simple and very high odds of, of, of success as well. Um, the last one that may sound strange, um, but, and I'll, I'll be curious to see, maybe you guys can, can give me a, um, a response in the question box. I guess I should, I should have a poll for this. Um, you can use the reassign button in a project to set a new reminder dashboard date. And uh, I'm gonna, if I could see a show of hands when I say, does everybody have a lot of late projects on their dashboard? Uh, I'm sure I'd see a big show of hands. Well, the reassign button is the way to change that. And it changes it in a positive way to make it so that you're, so that you're moving the projects forward and you're setting a time when you want to follow up. Whether you have an automated follow-up going at the same time or not, it just makes it very simple to keep, keep things out of the late bucket. When things are in the late bucket too long, they really should either be canceled as projects or again, set a new date. If, if this thing's, if you haven't talked to this person in two months, well, pull it up, reassign it to tomorrow, then pull the project up, call them and make a note. Maybe they'll say, I've already gone elsewhere. Maybe they'll say, hey, you know, why don't, can you get back to me and with the time that we might be able to follow up on this? And then you set that, set that appointment. So reassign or reschedule, really powerful tool to keep things moving forward and to keep your dashboard meaningful because you really want to have your dashboard have things on it that are, are relevant for you to be doing. Um, and I know a lot of people do this. I also know a lot of people don't. So it's a, but it's a really powerful tool. It also, during the process of reassignment, gives you the opportunity to document what's going on. So you can put in a note and those notes, as you know, get saved with the project. And then you can use those notes for, for reference later on down the road. So, um, and I've just been talking about the reassign button, so I probably should have showed this slide first. Um, the, yeah, the reassign button is really key. Uh, and it will show anytime a project has a due, an assignment date, which is all through the life cycle of a project, the reassign button will be there. In some cases, you'll see the reschedule button. Um, the reschedule button is for estimate appointments and for work schedules. Um, reassign is for when it's in any of the other states. And when, as I said, when you do the reassign, uh, the key things here are the 
the start uh, and the uh, when should it be completed by. So that's it. That's a reminder date. If this thing is anything except an appointment, it's a reminder date. So you can say, you know what? I'm gonna. I want to look this guy. I want this guy to show up on my dashboard in a month, and then I'll make sure to call them. So really powerful way to do that. Now that that means that you need to be keeping up with your dashboard. So you know, it there may be some discipline, and it may take a little time to get a handle on that. But once you do it, it becomes really powerful because you get this list of five or six things on your dashboard that are calls to make or things to follow up on today as well as some of the other things that, that you may have to do. Uh, really, really powerful concept. One second. Okay. Um, oops. Yeah, so, and then additionally in the reassign, with the reassign button, there's the option for notes. So you can always fill in a note there to update the project, to let yourself know, hey, I, I called them last week, I didn't get any answer, I'll try again next week. That's The notes is a great place and it, and it really helps. It helps not only for the during the course of the project, uh, many customers that use notes pretty religiously, they have that whole history of the project. And if a customer does call them back in the future with a problem or a question, having the list of notes there about the project just is, it's a, it's really can be a lifesaver for you because it makes it really easy for you to quickly explain what happened and when on a given project. So I really encourage that that use of notes and and uh, and especially the reassign button. Very very handy tool. Uh, reassign can also allow you to assign it to a different person as well, uh, which I didn't mention. But the main thing I wanted to hit there was the was the use of the dates because by using the dates, that'll put it on your dashboard on that date so that you can follow up with it. Okay, so uh, reassign, talked about that. Next thing is, um, before we can get go crazy with follow-ups, you gotta know about email templates. And again, there are a lot of email templates that are built in when you get your uh, Estimate Rocket account, which is great, um, but... Uh, email templates give you the ability uh, to, to make changes to those all those templates that we give you. So in the uh, settings, I'm gonna jump into the app here. Uh, in the settings, email templates is your list of email templates. So again, we give you a whole bunch of templates to begin with. Uh, these are all yours, to obviously, to have your way with and make changes to as you see fit, add new ones. Um, if you are typing emails manually in Estimate Rocket, there are so few cases where you should have to do that. And if you have to do that, the amount that's unique probably should be a sentence. So you can make yourself a general reply email template that you use for people or a thank you template that you use for people that you can pull up anytime you need to send an email. And then you fill in the one or two, the one sentence that's unique and you hit send. You can really, again, part of the idea of following up and the part of that uh, problem with following up is the hassle. If you can, you can use email templates to reduce that hassle. If it's really simple just to pull up an existing template, change a couple words and hit send, you're much more likely to do it than you are if you're, uh, you know, if you're writing every email from scratch, as obviously that's a big, big time suck because you just got to think about what to say. And I can tell you, we've all written the same emails a hundred times. I'm guilty too. And then we realize, oh, wow, I use that same email all the time. Making a template solves the whole problem for you. Makes it much easier. Plus, what it, the other thing it does, the little side bonus, and, and which is another powerful thing about templates, is it makes your responses consistent. So sometimes I know when I write an email, I will spend a long time writing that email, thinking about how I'm saying things, what my wording is like, um, what what concept I'm trying to get across, and it can take a while. But I've also found that most of my uh, I've also found that most of my emails uh, end up being reused. You know, there's a small changes in them. So after you've spent a whole lot of time uh, creating a great email, save it as a template because you're probably going to use it again. You know, especially if it's something thanking a customer or explaining something difficult to a customer. If you're in a in a field like 
um, you know, foundation repair or uh, concrete repair uh, or uh, remediation, you know, there may be things that you have to explain to customers that aren't, that A, are not necessarily going to make them happy, but also, but they need to be, they need to understand and they may be somewhat technical. So you, you know, you want to make sure you explain them in a way that they can understand them so that they realize what you're trying to, trying to get across to them. So, and, and what, you know, spending time on writing those communications is very important. You know, any, anything that you do, even emails are marketing. So how you write them, how you think through them is an important part of your whole communications. I, I strongly recommend also in terms of email templates that, um, that if you're not a great writer, and I'm not, I've asked for great amounts of help on the, some of the emails I write, and especially ones that are marketing and sales oriented, uh, to de-technicalize them and make them things that people are interested in buying, because uh, that's important. Sometimes too much technical description uh, is the anti-sales device, so we, we kind of want to avoid that. Um, so, so you can, and there are resources for that too. You can find, you know, you may have someone you know that speaks really well and, and think, hey, would you mind tweaking a few emails for me on that? Uh, it's, it's a very, very powerful, there, there are lots of resources out there. Don't, don't hesitate to go, uh, go search for them. All right, so uh, when we go into email templates, uh, when we start looking at the email templates, there's a couple of uh, things. So this is just a mashup screen of the email list, a template, and uh, the email in use in a project. So I just wanted to kind of show you the different elements. So when we're editing uh, an email template, I'm gonna go back in here and actually edit one. There's a, there's a couple key things here, and we do have several videos uh, on the website about this as well. So you can, there's some good educational uh, videos on how to do this. Most of them are pretty short and, and give you quick tips, but I'm just gonna give a little quick review. Um, you know, you have a title, the name of the email. You have some two options here, the client, the sender, and the project owner. And then you have an optional to address. So that optional to address can be used to send emails to someone who's not associated with the project. Um, and that can be handy. Uh, we have a lot of customers who will send an email, every email they send to an archive at theircompany.com. Um, and that way they've got this you know, master list of all the emails that ever got sent. Uh, you may also have a situation where you've got uh, a core project coordinator who you want to get certain emails but they're not gonna show up as the client, the sender, or the project owner. So you can actually hard code their email address into this optional to field. Uh, so that's, that's something that a lot of people use very effectively. Uh, you've got the subject and the body. Uh, important to note that you've got tokens to, that you can use here. Uh, and if you do need help on the tokens, it just click on the little help button while you're in this screen and scroll down, it has a list of all the tokens that are available for you to use. So these tokens allow you to get information from your account or the project into emails. So this is, how, this is really the power of the email templates because you can make, you can create an email that looks like it's completely customized to the customer, and in fact, it's just a boilerplate template. So again, really powerful. Uh, we got lots of resources on this and, and can certainly help you with it. Very, very powerful powerful tool. So you can write one email that can be used by any members of your team conceivably. Uh, and then finally down the bottom, there's uh, Markdown and plain text. I'm not gonna go into too much depth. Markdown gives you a little bit of an ability to uh, make the emails look a little bit more, a little bit fancier. Uh, that is all, that's all documented in the, in the help screen uh, on email templates. Uh, include project document and choose files is, Include project document just lets you determine whether you want to send the current project document, the PDF of the current project document with this email. Uh, if you're sending sales emails, typically uh, I'm recommending more and more against including the project document. Uh, if you want to send it once, great. I wouldn't have it on your first email. The problem is that there are so many issues with delivering uh, PDF attachments now because of all the bad actors out there that you wanna be sure that you're sending one or more emails that have no attachments on them. They're just text. And the reason for that is these, the, all the, the spam uh, pre prevention tools out there 
look at that as a red flag. So they see that, oh, there's an attachment. You're not in my uh, you know, sender list. So I'm gonna throw that in the spam folder. And if, whereas if you just put text in the body and you can use Markdown, that's not a problem at all. And you um, send a link to the customer portal so they can view it online, you virtually eliminate that delivery problem. So that's really, really important that one or more of your communications go without baggage, I'll call it. Uh, and that includes attachments as well. Uh, when you do the choose files to add additional attachments to the to the email template, uh, you just have to be very careful that a certain number of your follow-ups go with no attachments. So keep that keep that one in mind. All right, probably spent more time than I need on emails. Um, one other thing about so so the other one I wanted to show you was just what what the email templates look like uh, in the project. And the big, the only difference really in in the um, when you're using it on a project is this option down at the bottom, send now or send later. So sometimes I get asked about, um, can I send, you know, um, I have a campaign, but I want to send it at a different time, or I, I, you know, this doesn't really fit. This campaign doesn't quite fit. You can always put an email, create an email, click the later button, and then you can send it anytime you want. You pick the date and time, and that's when it will go. So that is always, it might be a hair more work than, than a campaign, and, and in a lot of cases, the campaigns work great. But if that doesn't entirely suit your needs, then you can use the send later button. That gives you infinite control over exactly when the email is going to go out. Uh, and again, regardless of who it's to, whether it's the customers or to you or, or project manager or whatever. So that's a really uh, important uh, feature. One other thing I want to mention is that if we use the send later, so we've got some scheduled emails here, uh, and that one's, oops, sorry, that one's going to be gone in a second. So if I, yeah, too late. Uh, let me go up to one of the scheduled ones. So on a scheduled email, Let's say we have another situation that happens is you set up a campaign and the campaign doesn't exactly have the right dates on it for you that you want. Uh, three out of the four are great, but you have one that you want to change. When the, when the campaign emails have not been sent yet, you can edit and you can change the send date. So even though the campaign may say, may by default set it up to go uh, today, tomorrow, five days from now, seven days from now, 20 days from now, um, you can go in and adjust the send date on any one of those after you've started the campaign, prior to it having been sent, but um, after you've started the campaign. So that just want, that's something that I think a lot of people don't know about that makes it really easy for them to come back in and make a quick adjustment to something. Maybe that's going to fall on a weekend day and you want it to fall on a weekday or vice versa. You do have the control of being able to reset that to a different date. All right, so that covers kind of covers the uh, from the template list to creating your templates uh, to the email actually sending in estimate rocket. And just one more uh, one quick note, and again, this is probably something everybody's already figured out. But when you look down in the email section at the different statuses where we have delivered, pending, scheduled, um, any of the emails that are that are scheduled can be edited. So you can go back in and make a change to any of the scheduled emails. That includes any email you send up to 10 minutes away. So in other words, if I go in and I create an email and I say send, um, it does give me a short delay. And if I quickly go down to that email right after I've sent it, I can in fact, um, I can in fact change that time. Let me just try that. Uh, nope, I lied. Sorry, any emails you manually send, go immediately. Any emails from a campaign, even if you have one with zero days, um, we'll, you'll have a 15 minute grace period before that first email goes out. So uh, I, did, I did lie about that, sorry. Uh, okay. So. All right, so that's email templates. And email templates, the reason I covered email templates first is because those are, um, those are what the camp, what the campaigns are made up of. So you really have to have your email templates before you can 
add them into a campaign. And one of the things that you'll notice in the, um, as we, and, and we're gonna move on to campaigns. So follow-up campaigns. Um, we've got multiple campaigns that are set up when you first sign up for Estimate Rocket. So there's lots of things in there for you to use. Um, they are all set to manual mode when you first sign when you first sign up for your account, though, and I'm going to cover that in a minute. What that means. Uh, you can tweak the templates that we, that are set up. You can tweak the frequency of how you know when the uh, communications get sent, and you can uh, you can tweak the emails to follow up with a call. I love love the term "fu" for follow up, but <laughs> you can you can tweak the emails. Uh, to follow up with a call to you, which is what I was mentioning earlier, which I think is one of the most powerful hacks going. Uh, you get the email, because one of the things you can do in your email template for that with a token is to put in the customer's email, uh, customer's phone number, uh, and also a link to the project. So it just makes it really easy, because a lot of us kind of live in our inboxes um, to, to jump back into Estimate Rocket and be able to get to the information that you need for that customer uh, right from that email. Okay, so uh, follow-up campaigns is the next place we're gonna go take a look at. So what's a follow-up campaign? A follow-up campaign is simply a sequence of uh, email templates to send over uh, some period of time. So let's go look at a specific example. The one that, when you uh, first sign up for Estimate Rocket, the one that has the most emails set up for it are, is the pending acceptance campaign. Now, when we when we create the email templates for you, the email can, follow up campaigns for you, uh, we tried to keep the naming of those templates um, pretty straightforward and easy to identify. So you'll notice that the email templates that you start out with that are on your uh, campaigns start with things like estimate follow up one, follow up two, follow up three, follow up four, follow up five. Um, that makes, a, makes it easy for a couple of uh, things. One is these are emails that you don't necessarily want to just randomly pick um, you know, when, from, uh, from the list when you're going to send an email to someone. And there's a way I'll show you in the email templates that you can prevent, uh, you can determine when emails are going to show up in the list. Um, not sure how many of you have ever noticed this estimate, this type on the email template. But basically, the type lets you specify that this particular template is for a specific state of the project. So if I say all projects, then that template is going to show up no matter what state the project is in. Uh, if I say none, it's never going to show up in the email template list. So none can be very handy to use uh, on templates that are designed to be in a campaign. And in fact, if you look at um, if you look at the follow-ups uh, at the estimate follow-ups, most of those uh, my my demo system isn't as good as your systems probably are. For the most part, those will end up being set up as none, like this complete after project follow-up uh, one and two. So those are set to none, and basically that means that the only time you're really going to see that email to pick it out of a list is when it when you're using it on a template. So you don't have to do that. It's just one of those things that may uh, help prevent when you get a whole boatload of email templates in there. It can help you prevent from seeing the wrong templates at the wrong times. Okay, so back to follow-up campaigns. Uh, and again, I wish I had a show of hands for how many people have actually, A, are using them, and B, have ever actually modified them or, or made changes to them. When you first uh, get Estimate Rocket in your new account, your pending acceptance campaign is set up with five emails uh, and it is set to manual mode. So first of all, what does manual mode mean? Manual mode simply means that this campaign, in order for this campaign to start on a project, it has to be in the pending acceptance stage and you have to click the start campaign button. That's all that means. If you set it to automatic, it means when this project arrives, is moved into the pending acceptance stage. So when you hit complete estimate button, it moves it into pending acceptance. It will automatically initiate this campaign. That's the only difference. 
So any campaign that you're always comfortable with going out automatically should be set to automatic. So I think appointment confirmations, for example, are no brainers for setting to automatic. Uh, depending upon your company and the types of work you do, uh, pending acceptance is typically a no-brainer for that, um, and pending schedule is probably also a no-brainer for that. Um, but again, this is one of those th areas where I strongly recommend that you create a project, um, create a couple uh, test projects, and you start the campaigns on those test projects, because once you start the campaign at any stage in the project, you can simply come down to the email section and see what it did. This is going to show you when you start campaign, it's going to show you exactly what those emails are that are pending to go out. So there's no mystery. And then you can always stop campaign if you need to, because you decide you don't, you know, you don't want that campaign to go out after all. So it's really easy to experiment with. And I do highly like everything else in Esmer Rocket, you got to experiment with it a little bit and get, you know, give it a try out and, and make sure you understand what it's doing and of course as always just you know give us a shout in the chat box in the chat box and we can help out with it so uh next section is the emails so uh what emails are we going to send and after how many days so it's saying okay send estimate follow-up one after two days if you put zero days in here it will send it in 15 minutes of the time you hit the start campaign button or the time that it is automatically started so zero gives you the ability to basically to send it now, to start that one now. A um, couple caveats, you cannot have multiple uh, sends per day. So you can have one day apart, uh, as many as you want, but not more than one in a day. And that is primarily because we really don't want to send too many emails uh, too frequently to people because we all know what happens to our inboxes when we do that. Um, so in, Again, talking about the defaults, the default setup for the uh, for this campaign is, now this assumes that you hit complete estimate and then you emailed the customer the estimate email, which gives them a link to the portal or has a PDF and, and they get that. So this after two days is one that goes out and basically says in two days and says, did you get your email? Did you get your, um, did you get your estimate? And then it's going to go out after seven days. Another one's going to go out after seven days. Another one after 14 days. Another one after 28 days. And another one after 320 days. So the 320 days, that's my favorite. Because that's the one that people talk to me about and say, man, I just this guy just called me out of the blue and said he wanted to do this project that I sent them a proposal for almost a year ago. So... Again, this is a, so there's five emails in this sequence. Uh, some of these could be turned so that this email follow-up to maybe should be a phone call. Uh, you might want a few more emails really short in the sequence. Um, this is one of those things that you have to work out and you have to decide, um, you know, based on your customers, what you think their uh, threshold for pain is, uh, if you will. And I do really recommend, again, I can't strongly enough recommend it, that some of the, one or more of these follow-ups need to be to you to give them a call because that's really the best thing to do. And again, these days, a phone call that says, hey, I just wanted to uh, reach, reach out to you and make sure that the proposal I sent you two days ago did not go in your spam folder. That is a pretty legit uh, uh, and caring uh, reach out that may in fact end up with a conversation that shows how much you care that you were following up to make sure that they actually got what you sent out. So, you know, never has it never uh, underplay the power of a phone call. I know, again, I'm a, I'm a tech guy. I like chat. I like typing things. Um, but I also know that I have the best probability of, of a getting people to understand what I'm about uh, and what I'm capable of in a phone conversation or in a Zoom call or whatever your you know method of communication choice is. So you can have as many items in the sequence as you want. Uh, can't do multiple things on the same day currently, uh, but you can keep adding them on here. I know there's going to be some conversation about you know how much is too much. Well, we've already heard that five is the minimum. So 
most people with drip campaigns like this, uh, depending upon the nature of their business, uh, are gonna have a relatively heavy sequence in the first two weeks, because that's that's prime time, that's when they're most likely to go. And this may in fact not be aggressive enough for that. So you might say, I wanna go two days, three days, third day is a phone call, fifth day is you know another email, sixth day is another phone call, and then start spreading them out to you know six months and a year, something like that, or once a month, for three or four months. And then most people use sort of a declining frequency um, you know, method where you start out with pretty heavy with it when there's a huge interest and then you gradually drop that off. Um, one of the things that I was actually surprised to read in some of my research for this is um, most people are advocating knowing when to quit. <laughs> so in other words, at a certain point, you become an irritation of the person and you're much less likely to you know, uh, close the deal. Now, what that doesn't necessarily apply to is if in addition to what you're doing with your drip campaigns, you are doing some sort of a newsletter or some sort of community announcement or something that's valuable information to the customer. Because if those kinds of communications, you can feather those in any time. Um, and we recommend using, um, you know, a service like MailChimp or something along those lines to handle those ongoing, you know, monthly newsletter oriented type communications. They're very cost effective. Um, MailChimp is great at delivering that stuff. We are focused on transactional email, which means things that are associated with a, a specific transaction with the customer. Um, and that's that's how we maintain our, our levels of deliverability. So uh, that's a lot. It's a lot about uh, follow-up campaigns. Um, Maybe there'll be more, a whole bunch of questions. I'm just not sure, but I'm gonna, I'll move on. So yeah, as many days, as many of these as you want, don't go crazy. Um, one nice thing and one important thing is that these will, these campaigns will um, end when the project moves to the next step. So when you initiate a follow-up campaign, any unsent emails at the time you move the project to the next step, step. so if we're in pending acceptance and you accept work, that will cancel any pending emails waiting to go out from that campaign. So that's a real handy tool. So you know you're not they're not going to you're not going to continue to bombard them. Okay. Uh, not one other important thing about uh, campaigns that I wanted to cover uh, was really just to talk about the stages where the campaigns are handy. So. Um, not everybody uses the lead. Um, I typically recommend that you start the project and the default is to start the project to schedule an estimate. Um, so basically that's the get appointment stage. Uh, depending upon how that lead comes into you, uh, you may be making an appointment at the time of the phone call. That's great because that'll move and the project will move on. If you're not though, if these leads are coming in from a website or you know some automation or through Zapier, then you know, setting a campaign to fire for one of those is useful to say, hey, I, you know, got your request for an appointment, you know, let, can you, uh, let, let me know what time you want an appointment, you know, just reach out to set the appointment. And again, phone call is probably a good idea, so that email, you may want to go to you. Uh, estimate confirmation, that one to me is kind of a no-brainer. Uh, you, you schedule an appointment with somebody, it sends them a confirmation out. That's, you know, that's a, a a uh, simple uh, handshake and almost never a uh, dangerous thing to do. So that's one of the ones that I think is is you know highly uh, highly easy to automate. Uh, schedule work, um, you know that's a that's a manual one. So that's kind of on that's usually in in our court. Uh, but when the work is scheduled, the confirmation of the schedule date of the work dates that's again an easy one to do with the customer and have that go out automatically. Um, sending invoices, uh, oops, sending invoices, yep, I think, you know, making sure the bill gets sent, that's pretty important, uh, unless you collect on the site, which a lot of people do now, uh, and then, oops, sorry, uh, collect payment, uh, pay the bills, so once you've sent them a bill, again, if they're not paying instantly, you may need a drip campaign to follow up, uh, a dunning campaign, if you will. And then one of the most important uh, campaigns I think there is, is the project complete campaign. So when you complete project, there is a follow-up campaign. 
and it defaults to having two emails on it right now. But this is a really powerful one. So I, I sh this probably should be called the uh, referral campaign. So the first, you know, the first follow-up basically says it's been 30 days. Um, you know, uh, refer us business is a, you know, you can you have to take a look at some of these campaign emails before you use them. Uh, I recommend that. Um, but the complete file after uh, after follow-up one is after 30 days, and then there's another one after 320 days. So again, that follows up with them a year later, hopefully to inspire some more business or ask for referrals. But in these follow-up, automated follow-up ones uh, for the com project complete is, you can ask them for a referral. You can ask them, uh, you can send them links to your uh, Facebook page or your uh, Google uh, referrals, uh, Google, um, your Google page in order to leave you, leave you a recommendation. Um, so th this is a great, great opportunity both for short-term follow-up to say, hey, we care about you and you know, we want your feedback. And then for longer term to say, hey, don't forget about us. So hopefully with, with those, those, even if you're not doing some sort of a mailing list, at least when you've done work for someone, they're going to get an email from you next year. And hopefully if there's more work to do, that'll inspire that. So those are the those are the key states. And again, there's a campaign available for every stage of the project. So uh, definitely don't hesitate to use the other ones as well. Uh, one other piece of that I wanted to show you. Oops. Yeah. So once you've initiated campaigns, one other little thing that's very handy to know about is that on the on the follow up campaign settings uh, page, you can actually get to the projects that have campaigns running. So if you have some issue or you want to find out, hey, who, who out there actually has this campaign still going, you can come in here and click on that link, and that's going to give you a report of all the projects that are currently in that pending campaign stage. And then you can open the projects, and if you needed to, you could stop the campaign or you could go adjust a date or, or whatever. This is one of the ways that I know Estimate Rocket is still working well is because I get on a regular basis, I get the annual follow-up campaign <laughs> from projects with my email address on them, so always kind of fun. All right, uh, and I think we've already kind of covered the key follow-up stages. Uh, so I've got a few resources here. Um, this will go out uh, in. The, we'll send out a link to everybody who attended to the to the uh, presentation. And also, there will be a video for this webinar as well. Um, again, any any you know questions you have, you can always get a hold of us in the in the chat box. I'd like to thank everybody for being here today. I uh, really appreciate it. I hope everybody has a uh, safe and uh, healthy and uh, happy holiday season. And uh, I look forward to seeing you again on our next success webinar. Thanks, everyone. Bye bye.